today's video, I wanted to start with a really interesting story about this wonderful person, James Lind, who in 1753 became very famous for his findings while working as a surgeon for the British Royal Navy and for essentially conducting the world's first controlled medical experiment, an experiment that eventually saved thousands if not millions of lives. And so here's what essentially happened. He was working on HMS Salisbury, whose mission was to patrol the water around France. And as many times before, a lot of sailors on his boats started to experience a strange deadly disease. They were all extremely tired, they would often lose their teeth and their gums would turn very strange color, and many of them would eventually die. And the science behind this disease was unknown, but many believed that it had something to do with some kind of a liquid inside the body that could be purified by treating it with acids or certain other remedies. It seemed to help some people, but didn't help everyone. And so here Lind decided to conduct what's considered to be the first controlled clinical trial. He found 12 sailors who seemed to be experiencing this disease and divided them into six separate groups. And each group would receive the same standard diet, but also something special. A different supplement that would be either cider, acid drops, vinegar, seawater, two oranges and one lemon, and a spicy paste with barley water. And well, to his surprise, there was one group that seemed to improve almost right away. Two sailors receiving oranges and lemons showed dramatic improvement within just six days, with the other five groups remaining sick and showing no significant recovery. And this was a groundbreaking discovery, even though at first James Lind didn't really understand its significance. He essentially discovered the cure for scurvy. And though his initial findings were ignored at first, after decades and decades of naval experience, eventually lemons became the standard issue ending scurvy among sailors on all long voyages. But it was really only much later that we actually realized why citrus seems to work. It was because of this molecule, vitamin C, also known as absorbic acid, which is essentially a water-soluble vitamin that though primarily only acts as a cofactor in forming other proteins and also works as an antioxidant, in essence represents a vital molecule for the human body indirectly responsible for the production of proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and protecting the body from damage by free radicals and reactive oxygen species. It also helps generate other vitamins like vitamin E and is essentially one of the most crucial vitamins we seem to have. But despite its importance, there is really this one question that nobody could answer for a very long time until relatively recently. For some reason, humans and a few other animals seem to be unable to physically produce vitamin C directly and have to obtain it through diet only, usually by eating things like citrus fruits, berries and vegetables, or sometimes through other sources, but always by eating. And so in this video, we're going to discuss this vital molecule and specifically explore a fascinating recent discovery that challenges this long-held assumption in biology of why humans and some other primates and a few other animals cannot seem to produce vitamin C while many other animals can. With all this explored in this recent study by Gon Wen Cheng and a team you see right here. And here I guess let's start with the obvious. So when it comes to most animals on earth, pretty much almost everything has this remarkable ability of producing their own vitamin C internally. So for example mice, many birds, reptiles and pretty much everything in between usually contain metabolic pathways that allow these animals to synthesize their own absorbic acid or vitamin C using a very specific enzymatic process. And here this pathway is catalyzed by an enzyme called GULO or L-gulonolactone oxidase that in case you really wanted to see kind of looks like this. And this is essentially a kind of a factory responsible for the production of vitamin C. And once again, most animals have this. And once again, there is a really important reason why. Vitamin C is a crucial cofactor in a lot of enzymatic processes. For example, it's essential for the synthesis of collagen. This is something we find inside connective tissues like skin and bones, but even inside blood vessels. And so without vitamin C, collagen becomes unstable, which is why in a lot of those sailors back in the 18th century, one of the first problems was usually in regards to their gums. The collagen was basically falling apart. 
but it also plays a major role in producing certain neurotransmitters, essentially improving the way our brain works. Not to mention that it's also a very powerful antioxidant that's always protecting our body from pretty much any potential damage. But in humans, and also a few other animals, and also certain bats, certain rodents like guinea pigs, and what's known as teleost fish, this unusual factory, this Google factory, seems to have completely shut down. And so why exactly do these fish, guinea pigs, certain bats and certain primates find themselves without this very, very crucial process? Well, for a very long time, the prevailing scientific explanation was not very satisfactory. It basically suggested that this was an evolutionary neutral. Or, in other words, this protein became redundant and not important for as long as our ancestors were consuming enough vitamin C from their diet. So basically because those fish, guinea pigs and humans were eating stuff that contained vitamin C, we no longer needed to produce this very important factory. But this of course didn't really explain why other animals were still producing so much. And so even though this kind of makes sense that I guess natural selection didn't need to preserve this protein, and maybe this was just to preserve energy for something else, it still doesn't explain why so many other fish still have it, why some bats still produce it as well, and of course why so many other complex animals have it too. For example, elephants produce their own vitamin C. And so here there was this very bizarre paradox that was super difficult to explain for many, many decades. How can such an important fundamental vitamin, that's basically crucial for numerous bodily functions, become so easily discarded? And it's this very question that drove the researchers behind the recent study to re-examine this hypothesis in regards to the loss of vitamin C, with the work that was recently published unveiling a new compelling hypothesis. The inability to synthesize vitamin C might actually offer a robust physiological benefit in the context of fighting off certain parasitic infections. Or just to rephrase this, by not having vitamin C, our bodies might have learned to protect themselves from certain parasites. With most of this centered around a widespread and devastating parasite referred to as schistosomiasis, also known as snail fever or katayama fever. A parasitic flatworm that still affects quite a lot of people, actually up to about 250 million people worldwide, by living inside people's bodies. And here these worms first live in the host circulatory system and can actually live inside for decades, laying hundreds or even thousands of fertilized eggs every single day. And it's really these eggs and not the adults that seem to mostly cause the disease. These eggs usually get lodged inside the liver, eventually leading to severe organ damage and a lot of other issues. And here's roughly what this little guy looks like under a microscope. But in order to investigate this hypothesis, researchers used mice. Now remember, mice normally can produce their own vitamin C. But to investigate this link, researchers also used mice that were genetically modified to not have gulo and that essentially could not produce their own vitamin C, requiring vitamin C supplements in order to survive. And the experiment was actually pretty simple. Comparing gulo deficient mice on a vitamin C deprived diet with normal wild type mice, they can obviously synthesize their own vitamin C, but after infecting both groups with this Schistosoma mansoni, one of these parasitic worms. And the results were striking. In the wild type mice, the infection led to the typical severe symptoms, usually producing enlarged livers, spleens, and extensive granulomas. This was a result of a dramatic increase in parasitic eggs and would eventually lead to liver fibrosis. Most of these mice became very ill and quite a lot of them died. But the gulo deficient mice, the ones without vitamin C factory, seem to be remarkably protected, suggesting that these worms seem to rely on their host for this vitamin. And so even though worms could technically grow and even survive for a long time, they were unable to produce viable eggs and eventually only produced eggs that seemed to be dead, with these mice basically containing practically no damage in their liver because the worms just could not reproduce. And this suggested that they were directly protected from the severe liver damage and different types of inflammation usually associated with these worms. But crucially, they actually contained no worms inside their stool. Here we're talking about mouse poop. And by having no eggs in their feces, this blocked the transmission of the disease to other mice and of course other animals. In essence, completely preventing the parasite from reproducing and from spreading further. But perhaps most importantly, in experiments designed to mimic more natural exposure patterns, where vitamin C levels might fluctuate, 
intermittent depletion of vitamin C provided a robust survival advantage to a lot of these glue deficient mice, indicating that it's possible to protect the organism from this parasite without also experiencing scurvy. But I guess the main question is, so how exactly does this protection actually work? Well, here it seems that the host-derived vitamin C seems to be essential for the development of specific egg-making cells in the female worms. These are usually referred to as vitellocytes. And without sufficient vitamin C, vitellaria, or the organ responsible for producing these cells, seems to fail to mature. In other words, the irony here is that even the worms require vitamin C for the production of certain proteins and certain organs. And so here the vitamin C seems to regulate the production of these organs through a very specific genetic modification. It basically acts as a switch, enabling these parasites to produce viable eggs. And so it's not that the vitamin C killed the parasite, it just disabled its reproduction system, which then disables the ability to cause disease or to even transmit to new hosts. But what does this mean for the idea behind human evolution or the evolution of other species such as guinea pigs and certain fish? Well, here this research basically suggests that none of this was random and none of this was a result of this protein just becoming redundant, but was instead a significant evolutionary trade-off where the risk of scurvy was potentially outweighed by a powerful defense against widespread and deadly parasite, potentially very similar to schistosomiasis. Now here it's not entirely certain what parasite this was because all of this very likely evolved 60 to 70 million years ago, but because here we assume that these parasitic infections were very common, this bizarre mechanism could have significantly reduced pathology and dramatically improved evolutionary advantage. And because vitamin C could be obtained just by eating something, here this trade-off was quite beneficial. And the additional conclusion here is that vitamin deficiencies may not always be detrimental. As a matter of fact, this is one example where vitamin deficiency seems to provide significant protection. Here it seems to protect animals from various pathogens, mostly because those parasites also require the same vitamins for their own survival. And mostly because those pathogens and those parasites seem to have also lost the ability to use that glue protein for the production of vitamin C. And this means that the natural tendency for the vitamin C levels to fluctuate may be a deep-seated evolutionary adaptation something that might protect our body from constant invaders. And this of course suggests that researchers might now need to focus on figuring out what other complex parasites might require vitamin C. And so this research doesn't just open new avenues for understanding human evolution, it also potentially presents us with future therapeutic strategies. So here, by depriving certain parasites of certain essential nutrients, it might become possible to mitigate certain diseases. And for all we know, maybe other common parasites, like the ones that cause malaria, for example, could also be affected by something very similar. So definitely a really intriguing study and an intriguing reminder that the story of life on Earth, and of course our place on it, is far more intricate and far more intriguing than we ever thought. But at least for now, that's all I wanted to mention. We'll definitely come back and discuss this more if there are some additional discoveries, but even as is, this is already such a fascinating study and such a cool discovery. Thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the show on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining the channel membership that grants you early access, or maybe by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.